Pelvic, hip, and thigh conditions. The pelvic, hip, and thigh conditions to be discussed are fractures, which include pelvic ring fractures, femoral fractures, avulsion fractures, and stress fractures, hip dislocations, acetabular labrum tears, osteitis pubis, avascular necrosis, leg calf parthes disease, slipped capital femoral epiphysis, trochanteric bursitis, hip pointer, quadriceps contusion, and muscle strains. In pelvic ring fractures, the pelvic ring is disrupted anteriorly and posteriorly in at least two or more places. The pelvic ring is composed of three bones, the paradenominant bones and the sacrum. The pelvic bones are stabilized by supporting ligaments. The most common cause in the elderly is a fall, but the most significant fractures involve high energy forces such as a motor vehicle crash, cycling accidents, or falling from a significant height. Complications are likely to result in cases of excess blood loss or punctures to certain organs, possibly leading to shock. Swelling and bruising may result more so in high impact injuries. Pain in the affected areas may differ and may radiate if symptoms are aggravated when one moves around. Management of pelvic ring fractures includes immediate referral, checking for a distal pulse, and treating for hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock is a condition in which there is a decreased blood volume, most likely due to the excessive internal bleeding and complications associated with the fracture. Diagnosis is made on the basis of history, clinical features, and special investigations, usually including x-ray or CT scans. Because the pelvis cradles so many internal organs, pelvic fracture may produce significant internal bleeding, which is invisible to the eye. Emergency treatment consists of advanced trauma life support management. After stabilization, the pelvis may be surgically reconstructed. A fractured femur is a breakage in the thigh bone, the longest and strongest and heaviest bone in the human body. The strength and the size of the femur means that under typical circumstances, a large force or extensive trauma is needed in order to result in fracture. Motor vehicle accidents and falls are examples of common accidents that result in fractured femurs. Conversely, femoral fractures that occur after low energy trauma suggest the presence of some underlying bone condition. A fractured femur in a child may also be a sign of child abuse, so it's something to be aware of if you work in a public school system. Symptoms of a fractured femur can include severe pain, bleeding, deformity of the leg, tissue swelling, and being unable to move your leg. Blood loss can be severe and may lead to hypovolemic shock. In some cases, bone fragments may protrude from the skin. Fracture of the femur are commonly associated with traumatic circumstances that may result in injuries to other areas of the body as well. Treatment of a broken femur involves the restoration of normal anatomical position of the bone fragments and referral to reduce the fracture. The exact method used for treatment depends on the individual situation and must take into account the extent and nature of the break as well as the treatment for any other injuries that must occur. Both surgical and non-surgical treatments may be considered. A fractured femur is an emergency situation. Seek immediate medical care. Call 911 for serious symptoms, such as trauma followed by the inability to move your leg, severe pain, swelling, bleeding, or deformity. An avulsion fracture occurs when a piece of bone tears away from the site which the muscle attaches to the bone. Muscle attaches to the bone by a thick tissue called a tendon. When the muscle contracts quickly or forcefully, it can cause the tendon to pull off a part of the bone. A pelvic avulsion fracture refers to a broken part of the bone that occurs in the pelvic area, which includes the hips, buttocks, and upper thighs. Several muscles in the pelvic area can cause avulsion fractures and pain at different areas along the pelvis, especially where there are open growth plates in children and teenagers. These type of fractures are often caused by sudden forceful contraction of the abdominal muscles, the hip or thigh muscles, or the hamstring muscles. Irritation of the growth plate can also occur without an avulsion fracture, which is known as apophysitis. Young athletes, especially adolescents at the age of puberty, are higher risk for pelvic avulsion fractures. Pelvic avulsion fractures are frequently seen in sports that require sprinting, rapid changes in movement or jumping, such as track, tennis, soccer, and hockey. Athletes who have tight muscles or fail to properly warm up and stretch prior to exercise are at greater risk for this type of injury. Pelvic avulsion fractures typically cause sudden pain and it may be severe at the site of the bone injury. Other symptoms include swelling, bruising, limitations in the range of motion, 
painful motion, inability to bear weight, and possibly limping. Some common sites of pelvic avulsion fractures include the iliac crest, the front of the pelvis, and the ischial tuberosity. Pelvic avulsion fractures require a long period of rest and changes in activity in order to heal. Typically, these injuries will get better in just four to six weeks with rest. It is recommended to place the joint in an elastic compression spica to immobilize the joint and then use crutches for the first one to two weeks. Immediate referral is necessary to determine if the torn piece of bone is very large or if it's torn away from its original location by a large distance, as surgery may be recommended. A femoral stress fracture is a condition characterized by an incomplete crack of the femur. Several muscles of the hip, knee, and thigh attach the femur. When these muscles contract, a pulling force is exerted on the bone. In addition, weight-bearing activities place compressive forces on the femur. When these forces are excessive or too repetitive or beyond what the bone can withstand, bony damage can gradually occur. This initially results in a bony stress reaction, However, with continued damage may progress into a femoral stress fracture. A stress fracture of the femur typically occurs over time with excessive weight-bearing activities such as running, sprinting, jumping, or dancing. They often occur following a recent increase in activity or change in training conditions such as the surface, footwear, or training techniques. They are particularly common in long-distance runners. Patients with this condition typically experience a poor localized pain in the front of the thigh that increases with the impact of activity, such as running, jumping, sprinting, or hopping. It will typically decrease with rest. Pain may also cause the patient to cease activity. Occasionally, pain may radiate into the knee or the back of the thigh. In severe cases, walking or standing may be enough to aggravate the symptoms. Other symptoms may be night ache, Pain when sitting with the thigh over the edge of a chair, especially if a downward force is applied at the end of the thigh, or pain on firmly touching the affected region of the bone. With the appropriate physical therapy, most patients with a femoral stress fracture can make full recovery or return to a normal sport or normal activities in a period of 3 to 12 months. In more severe cases, recovery may take 1 to 2 years or longer, depending on the intervention required and a range of other factors. In rare cases, some patients may experience ongoing symptoms or complications that may require further management. Dislocation of the hip is an uncommon injury to the hip joint. Dislocations occur when the ball-shaped head of the femur comes out of the cup-shaped acetabulum set in the pelvis. This may happen to varying degrees. Hip dislocations occur more commonly in females than males. 9 out of 10 hip dislocations are posterior. In a posterior dislocation, the affected limb will appear shortened. The leg will also have an adducted and internally rotated appearance. In an anterior dislocation, the limb will appear to be longer, and it will have an abducted and external rotated appearance. In both cases, the affected leg is virtually immovable by the patient and is usually extremely painful. When managing a hip dislocation, early referral is important. In addition to a dislocation, it is important to suspect a possible fracture or labral tear as the force needed to dislocate the hip is pretty large. Check the distal pulse on the patient and treat for hypovolemic shock. The acetabular labrum is a ring of cartilage that surrounds the acetabulum of the hip. The anterior portion is the most vulnerable when the labrum tears. It provides an articulating surface for the acetabulum, allowing the head of the femur to articulate with the pelvis. It is estimated that 75% of acetabular labrum tears have an unknown cause. Tears of the labrum have been credited to a variety of causes such as excess force, hip dislocations, capsular hip hypermobility, hip dysplasia, and hip degeneration. A tight iliopsoas tendon has also been attributed to labrum tears by causing compression or traction injuries that eventually lead to a labral tear. Most labrum tears are thought to be from a gradual tear due to repetitive microtrauma. Incidents of labrum tears increase with age, suggesting that they may be also caused by deterioration through the aging process. Traumatic injuries are most commonly seen in athletes who participate in contact or high-impact sports such as football, soccer, or golf. The prevalence rate for traumatic hip injuries that causes a tear in the labrum is very low. Less than 25% of all patients can relate a specific incident to their torn labrum. However, they are often the result of a dislocation or fracture. 
Falling on one side causes a blunt trauma to the greater trochanter of the femur. Since there is very little soft tissue to diminish this force between the impact and the greater trochanter, the entire blow is transferred to the surface of the hip joint. And since the bone density does not reach its peak until the age of 30, hip traumas could result in a fracture. Tears to the labrum can be classified in a variety of ways, including morphology, etiology, location, or severity. The management of acetabular labrum tears might include crutches if full weight bearing is difficult, referral to a physician, and potentially imaging of the hip to determine the extent of injury. Frequent pivoting on a loaded femur, such as in ballet, is a common mechanism for labral tears in athletes. Osteitis pubis is an overuse injury characterized by tissue damage and inflammation to the pelvis at the site where the two pubic bones join. This results in groin pain. Osteitis pubis is usually an overuse injury, which commonly occurs due to repetitive or prolonged activities placing strain on the pubic symphysis. This commonly occurs due to repetitive running, kicking, or changing in direction of activities. It's commonly seen in running sports such as football, hockey, and athletics, particularly marathon runners. It is also frequently seen in rodeo athletes from the amount of pressure on the legs to hold the cowboy or cowgirl onto a horse or bull. One of the main causes is instability of the pelvic bones, and in particular the pubic symphysis. The instability is aggravated when asymmetrical loads are placed through the pelvis, such as when running or kicking. These activities are normally well accommodated by the normal stable athlete, but with poor lumbopelvic control, the additional forces are uncontrollable and could cause injury. Patients may also develop osteitis pubis due to excessive abdominal muscle contractions, such as during repetitive sit-ups or following inadequate rehabilitation of other injuries, such as an adductor tendinopathy. Patients with osteitis pubis typically experience groin pain that develops gradually over time. Pain may be experienced on one or both sides of the groin. Pain can sometimes also be experienced in the lower abdominals or the front of the hips. The patient may experience pain upon firmly touching the pubic bone in the front of the pelvis. Pain may also increase when squeezing the legs together or moving the affected leg away from the midline of the body, such as an abduction. Pain is usually aggravated by exercises such as running, kicking, performing sit-ups, or changing of direction activities. In less severe cases of osteitis pubis, patients may only experience an ache or a stiffness in the groin that increases upon rest following activity. These activities typically include running, particularly involving changes of direction and kicking. The pain associated with osteitis pubis may also warm up with activity in the initial stages of the condition. As the condition progresses, patients may experience symptoms that increase during activity and affect performance. In severe cases, the patient may be unable to continue the activity and may limp or waddle as a result of the pain. Management of osteitis pubis is price and NSAIDs. If the patient is not improving, it may be a good idea to send them to a physician to be evaluated further. The vascular anatomy varies, but in 60% of patients, the medial and lateral femoral circumflex arteries originate from the profunda femoris artery. Most of the blood supply of the femoral head comes from the lateral femoral circumflex artery, which gives rise to three or four branches, the retinacular vessels. These run posteriorly and superiorly along the femoral neck in the synovial reflection until they reach the cartilaginous border of the head. The obturator artery gives rise to the vessels within the ligamentum teres. An ascending branch of the medial femoral circumflex artery supplies the greater trochanter and anastomosis with the lateral femoral circumflex artery. Avascular necrosis of the femoral head is a pathological process that results from an interruption of blood supply to the bone. Avascular necrosis of the hip is poorly understood, but this process is in the final common pathway of traumatic or non-traumatic factors that comprise the already precarious circulation of the femoral head. Femoral head ischemia results in the death of the marrow and osteocytes and usually results in the collapse of the necrotic segment. Avascular necrosis can either occur after a traumatic event or a non-traumatic event. Traumatic avascular necrosis typically occurs following a significant hip injury such as a dislocation. 
Non-traumatic avascular necrosis most frequently occurs after the patient has used specific medications such as steroids, suffers from blood coagulation disorders, or uses alcohol excessively, among other secondary causes. Leg calf parthes disease is an avascular necrosis of the proximal femoral head resulting from compromise of the tenuous blood supply to this area. Without sufficient blood flow, the bone begins to die, so it breaks more easily and heals poorly. This disease has an insidious onset and may occur after injury to the hip. Risk factors for leg calf parthes disease include age. Although leg calf parthes disease can affect children of nearly any age, it is most commonly occurring in children ages 3 through 8. A child's gender can also have a risk factor impact for leg calf parthes. Leg calf parthes is five times more common in boys than girls. Race can have an impact. Caucasian children are more likely to develop this disorder than are other races of children. Family history. In small number of cases, leg calf parthes appears to run in families. The signs and symptoms of leg calf parthes disease include limping, pain or stiffness in the hip, groin, thigh, or knee, limited range of motion in the hip joint, and leg calf parthes disease usually involves just one hip. Both hips are affected in some children, but usually at different times. The management for leg calf parthes disease may be either surgery or conservative treatment. To keep the ball part of the joint as round as possible, doctors may use a variety of treatments to keep it snug in the socket portion of the joint. The socket acts as a mold for the fractured femoral head as it heals, so a hip brace might be enough to limit motion and allow the bone to heal, or a surgical intervention might be necessary. A slipped capital femoral epiphysis is an unusual disorder of the adolescent hip. It is not rare. For reasons that are not well understood, the ball at the upper end of the femur slips off in a backward direction. This is due to weakness of the growth plate. Most often, it develops during periods of accelerated growth shortly after the onset of puberty. The cause of slipped capital femoral epiphysis is unknown. It occurs two to three times more often in males than females. A large number of patients are overweight for their height. In most cases, slipping of the epiphysis is slow and a gradual process. However, it may occur suddenly and may be associated with minor falls or trauma. Symptomatic slipped capital femoral epiphysis is treated early and well and allows for good long-term hip function. The typical patient has a history of several weeks or months of hip or knee pain and an intermittent limp. The appearance of the adolescent is characteristic. He or she walks with a limp. In certain severe cases, the adolescent may be unable to bear weight on the affected leg. The affected leg is usually turned outwards compared to the normal leg, and it may also appear to be shorter. Management for a slipped capital femoral epiphysis is placing the patient on crutches to limit weight-bearing activity and referring them to a physician. This condition may require surgery to correct. Trochanteric bursitis is an inflammation of the bursa at the outside or lateral point of the hip, known as the greater trochanter. When this bursa becomes irritated or inflamed, it causes pain in the hip. This is a common cause of hip pain. Trochanteric bursitis can result from one or more of the following events. Injury to the point of the hip, this can include falling onto the hip, bumping into the hip, or lying on one side of the body for an extended period of time. Play or work activities that cause overuse or injury to the joint areas, such activities might include running upstairs, climbing, or standing for long periods of time. Incorrect posture. This condition can be caused by scoliosis, arthritis of the lumbar spine, and other spine problems. Stress on the soft tissue as a result of abnormal or poorly positioned joints or bones, such as a leg link difference or osteoarthritis in a joint. Or other disease conditions. These may include rheumatoid arthritis, gout, psoriasis, thyroid disease, or an unusual drug reaction. In rare cases, bursitis can result from an infection. Previous surgery around the hip or prosthetic implants in the hip. The hip bone spurs or calcium deposits in the tendon that can attach to the trochanter. And bursitis is more common in women, especially in middle-aged or elderly populations. The symptoms of trochanteric bursitis include pain on the outside of the hip, thigh or into the buttocks, pain when lying on the affected side, 
pain when you press on the outside of the hip, pain that gets worse during activities such as getting up from a deep chair or getting out of a car, and pain with walking upstairs. The management for trochanteric bursitis will include price, NSAIDs, and deep friction massage, and possibly rest. A hip pointer is a contusion on the pelvis caused by a direct blow or a bad fall on the iliac crest or the hip bone, and a bruise to the abdominal muscle. Surrounding structures such as the tensor fascia lata and the greater trochanter may also be affected. This injury results from the crushing of soft tissue between a hard object and the iliac crest. Contact sports are a common cause for this type of injury, most often in football and hockey, and generally due to improper equipment or placement. The direct impact can cause an avulsion fracture where the portion of the bone is removed by a muscle. The pain is due to a nerve, the cuneal nerve, that runs right along the iliac crest, which makes this a very debilitating injury. This pain can be felt when walking, laughing, coughing, or even breathing deeply. Signs and symptoms include immediate pain, bruising and swelling, obvious weakness, spasms, and a rapid decline in the hip or leg function, resulting in decreases in range of motion. Management for hip pointers will include rest, price, and insets. Crutches may be used if walking is painful or difficult. The area should also be protected to avoid further injury. A donut pad is very effective in helping to protect hip pointers from further injury. Quadriceps contusions are the result of a severe impact on the thigh, which consequently compresses against the hard surface of the femur or the thigh bone. This often causes deep rupture into the muscle tissue and hemorrhage occurs, which is followed by inflammation. A quadriceps contusion is one of the more common injuries seen in athletes competing in contact sports and results from a direct blow to the front of the thigh. This type of injury often goes untreated and may result in serious complications for the athlete. If there is a major untreated or unresolved bleeding deep in the muscle, a serious condition known as heterotopic ossification can occur. Heterotopic ossification is the result of a hematoma within the muscle that calcifies rather than heals. Rather than the body healing the hematoma with fibroblasts or baby collagen fibers, the body lays down baby bone cells, resulting in a bony growth deep within the muscle. Common signs and symptoms for quadriceps contusions include immediate pain, bruising, or ecchymosis, and limited knee flexion. The initial treatment is critical in the successful outcome of a moderate or severe quadriceps contusion. Proper adherence to treatment protocols can minimize the possible complications of this type of injury. Immediate treatment includes utilizing the PRICE principle for treating sports injuries with a focus on the immediate application of ice to reduce bleeding and swelling in the muscle tissue. Because it is not possible to foresee how much bleeding will occur in the muscle, it is best to treat moderate thigh contusions conservatively. The athlete should be immediately pulled from participation. Continued activity will result in increased bleeding into the thigh because the heart is pumping harder and faster during physical exertion. This may also result in prolonged rehabilitation to remove the resulting hematoma and return function to the leg. Unlike most injuries, a quadriceps contusion needs to be treated with unique positioning of the athlete. The athlete needs to be positioned with the knee bent and maximal flexion while the ice pack is applied. This is done to maintain the flexibility of the quadriceps muscle group while swelling may be still present. The purpose of this position is not to stretch or enhance the flexibility of the muscle group, but only to maintain its functional integrity. After the ice treatment is complete, a six inch compression wrap should be applied to the thigh using slightly overlapping circles, beginning at the knee and working up towards the thigh. The compression wrap should be snug, but not too tight. The wrap will provide a mechanical barrier to help keep the swelling out of the muscle tissue. If the athlete has pain while walking and is limping, the athlete should be placed on crutches and be non-weight bearing for the first 24 to 48 hours. Pushing through the pain is not an option with this type of injury because of the seriousness of complications. Athletes should be encouraged to continue the use of crutches moving from non-weight bearing to partial weight bearing as pain diminishes. Muscle pulls are strains, or in severe cases, tears of the muscle fiber and or tendon. People commonly refer to strains as pulled muscles. According to the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the thigh muscle is the most common place for a strain or tear to occur. Common areas for thigh strains to occur are at the quadriceps muscle group, hamstring muscle group, and groin muscle group, 
with strains of the hamstring being the most common. Signs of a thigh strain are sudden and severe pain during exercise, along with a snapping or popping feeling, pain in the back of the thigh, lower buttock, or the front of the thigh when walking, straightening the leg or bending over time, tenderness or bruising. Severe strains can also be agonizing, which makes it impossible for the person to walk or even stand. If an athlete has sustained a grade one or two strain, price, NSAIDs, and a wrap or sleeve are proper management. If it is a grade three strain, then the person will need to be referred to a physician and will most likely need surgery to correct the damaged tissues.